Okay, I think we're about ready to go ahead and get started. Welcome back to the second day of the forecasting and markets workshop. If you want to uh, take a seat, this session is going to be a, a hybrid session. Um, Natika Mago of ERCOT is going to be chairing and she's remote. And our first speaker is in person. Our next two speakers are in person and the last two speakers are remote. So just to uh, get you all oriented properly. So I think I'll just go ahead and get started. This is kind of a continuation of uh, the discussion we were having yesterday about use of probabilistic forecast and po <clears throat> power uh, system planning and operations. I think it's gonna be a pretty, a pretty nice update from something we did a few years ago and incorporating a lot of the most recent experience and thinking. So I'm looking forward to it myself. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce Natika, who is involved with power system operations at ERCOT and let her go ahead and uh, take it away, Natika. I'm sure you're there somewhere. I am here. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Okay. Hope you are able to hear me loud and clear. Yes, we can hear you well and see you. Fabulous. Appreciate it. So again, thank you very much for that setup, Charlie, and Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm absolutely disappointed that couldn't be there in person, but uh, 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 very, very thankful uh, to be able to be uh, here uh, uh, at my house, but still be able to participate in this very important, uh, in what has become a very important challenge, a very important topic for our system operators and even uh, everybody in the industry. Uh, so, so, so uh, as Charlie mentioned, this is a really a continuation of a panel that probably uh, that uh, that was set up a few years ago. Uh, we, we here in the next two hours, we'll be spending a lot of time sharing with you uh, how various uh, system operators are taking on this challenge of uh, uh, integrating the volumes of uh, inverter-based and uh, renewable resources uh, into their into their systems, and how how are they taking on the challenge of continuing to operate their grids? Uh, what sort of uh, uh, tools? Uh, I mean, certainly, from uh, what has what is interesting is the traditional problem that the control room has to solve for hasn't changed. Uh, we, we are still looking to make sure we've got sufficient supply to co cover the the demand and reserves that we need at any given point of time. But the the variety of uncertainties that they are having to take into account, the variety of risks that they are having to take into account, has certainly evolved. Uh, and and today what we'll have what we have set up for you is uh, a very diverse set of panel. We'll we'll start out uh, uh, getting a perspective uh, from the European grid uh, with Jeff coming on uh, and and sharing uh, sharing what uh, uh, what challenges they are seeing on the other side of the pond and how they've been uh, what sort of tools what sort of uh, approaches they've put forth. Uh, in their EMS and MMS and uh, working with their vendors. And then we'll bring it back to here uh, closer to home, uh, uh, move over into get a perspective uh, from the Western side, from California and, and, uh, and New York ISO. Um, so for, to just give you a, a, a perspective of how we'll be hoping to run this session, we'll have, we've got about, uh, as uh, Charlie mentioned, about five panelists. We, we, we'll try to get through uh, each, uh, their presentations, each one of them has a, a, short, a brief presentation. So what, what we want to do is get to everybody's presentations. Hold on to your questions. We will uh, try to reserve uh, about 30 minutes or so at the tail end. Uh, we realize this is likely a very interesting topic that quite a few folks, uh, that the discussion today will stir quite a few uh, good uh, feedback and interaction. So we do want to preserve that time. Uh, for the panelists, I'll keep a track of your time and try to give you uh, a, 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 a nudge around the two minutes prior to your time ending. Um, uh, and and with that, we'll I'll get started. What I'll do is I'll invite Jeff, a learner, to come in and join us. Uh, uh, Jeff works uh, as a customer solutions manager at N4. 
uh, an energy and load forecasting firm in Copenhagen, Denmark. Jeff has spent the last 15 years in the energy industry focused on renewable energy forecasting problems. Jeff has a PhD from the University of Alabama in Huntsville in Atmospheric Sciences. So with that, Jeff, uh, uh, as soon as you're ready, please do take the stage. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, this will be interesting. My first uh, hybrid session being up on the podium. So I'm not sure where Nikita is going to come out from in two minutes. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'd like to talk a little bit today about um, uh, one of our customers' use cases of pro using probabilistic forecasts in their operations at TSO. And uh, first, I'll uh, let's see if the slide mover is working. No, that's all right. So a little bit outline of what I'll be talking about for the next 10, 15 minutes here. Uh, a little bit on why probabilistic forecasting and why now. Um, I'll give a use case example for the Irish uh, transmission system operator and talking about one of their products that's been in use since 2020 um, operationally. So um, they're kind of pushing the envelope in terms of uh, getting uh, probabilistic forecasts into their regular operational products. And then uh, a little bit about thoughts about the future use of probabilistic forecasting. And our, Ireland's a great case with an island system, uh, high penetration. Uh, so they're, and they're also building inter, more interconnection to other uh, countries. I'm not sure how many, how many of you know about N4. So I thought I'd just mention N4 for about 30 seconds. So you kind of understand where we are and where we fit in all this. Um, so we are an energy forecasting company and load forecasting located in a uh, Copenhagen area. Um, it's really a spinoff from the Danish Technical University um, starting about 2006. And uh, there are offices in other locations where we have data scientists uh, working on the team. Um, and uh, a lot of our clients like to have customized solutions that are kind of tailored to their needs, uh, specific needs, depending on where they are and what kind of uh, system they're operating. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of sample graphics of uh, some of the probabilistic forecasts that we deliver on a routine basis to clients. So what is the problem? Why are we doing this and why now? Um, we're seeing that a lot of our clients have this increased penetration of renewables um, and there's just greater uncertainty. So how do you manage that uncertainty with just deterministic forecasts? It doesn't work so well unless you have some way to quantify the uncertainty. So we provide typically quantiles, P10, P90, P25, but um, we also do scenario forecasting um, once our customers can define what the scenarios are. And uh, for any weather driven event, you could really define some likelihood of occurrence. Um, I give some examples up here, the dynamic capacity of transmission line, as was mentioned yesterday in a presentation um, where temperature and wind speed is a big factor into determining the line rating. Uh, the load, for, load forecasting, obviously, uh, with temperatures, grid congestion, rapid ramp events, which I'll be talking a little bit about here. And then also ultimately electric electricity price forecasting. So there is a learning curve here with uh, some of our clients, and we're we're actually educators in this sense. And um, I think a lot of forecast providers have to provide that kind of as part of their service, how to educate the clients in using the probab probabilistic forecasts. And that's been a theme throughout my career in the energy industry: is how do you uh, work with clients on making sure they can optimize the use of those forecasts. Okay, so the use case I'll be talking about for the next few minutes is the Irish grid operator, TSO, uh, Irish grid group. And uh, here are some attributes about their system. Um, it's about seven gigawatts peak demand in wintertime, and then the minimum in the summer. Um, you can see the fuel mix there. So wind is now the second largest contributor of generation. And uh, 
I'm, these figures here for the entire island, uh, it's kind of broken up by Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, but I'm just giving the all island figures here. But there are a lot of instances where they'll get to uh, 65%, 70% of um, non-synchronous uh, uh, generate, generators uh, contributing to the energy mix. And they actually have a constraint, as far as I understand, about 70% uh, where it can't go above that. So there, there has to be a certain number of uh, synchronous generators. I think it's five minimum. So they, they have to operate with these uh, security constraints. And there, there's kind of a weak two a couple uh, interconnects that are, are pretty small. They represent uh, usually about a small percent, less than 5% of, the, uh, of the, the contribution. And then in 2021, the latest year, uh, about 40% of the load was uh, uh, met by the renewables, which is mostly wind. Okay, so the current use case for probabilistic forecasts in our grid is uh, the ramping margin reserve requirement. And so this is where um, we're providing um, ramp forecast scenarios and uh, probabilities to the TSO. And they have to maintain this minimum level ramping capability uh, from offline to online uh, generation and demand units. So the risks are actually explicit in the operational scheduling. So I'll present to you some of the tools that they're using, some of the, uh, that they see in their operations room. Uh, but this is the definition that iGrid uses for their uh, ramping margin. Um, that's basically read it here, but the output or reduction in demand that any unit can provide with a given time period uh, when they receive that dispatch instruction and maintaining that output for a further period. And so I defined the three categories here. And uh, what's, what's interesting is there's, there's um, for each of these categories for the one hour ramping margin, uh, the three hour and the eight hour, there are a certain number of uh, participating units. Um, I think it's on the order of like 900 at the one hour and like 700 and some, some odd for the three and the eight hour. Okay, so the forecasts that we provide actually are the scenarios. Um, we produce a thousand scenarios of, of um, ramp, ramp um, megawatt values that go into um, their product, which I'll show you the, the dashboard. Um, but the way that we develop these thousand forecast scenarios at each uh, new forecast that we generate, either it's the one or three or eight hour, is we start with our deterministic uh, forecast point time series. So this is our traditional model where we incorporate historical measurements and historical NWP, and we produce our state-of-the-art uh, forecast that is minim minimizing like the mean absolute error or root mean square error, for example. Then uh, we produce an ensemble forecast that is conditioned on, um, we, get, um, we get the quantiles from uh, a latest NWP ensemble uh, forecast, either be the ECMWF or GFS. So once we have the quantiles, and then from the quantiles, we generate the different scenarios. And this is a more complicated step in which we, um, we have to do some, uh, uh, adaptive sampling and recurs recursive sampling uh, from the distribution of the, of the um, quantiles and the latest information that we get from the NWP models. So we, get, we come out with a thousand forecast scenarios that are um, respecting the quantiles. So they're as sharp as they can be because it's uh, taking into account the uh, deterministic forecast, the most accurate forecast. And they're also reliable in that they're respecting these uh, different percentiles, the 10, 20, 30, 40. And they're also independent. Uh, so what, basically what we're left with then is we, uh, from, the from the thousand, we're able to compute just by the number of events for a probability of exceedance of 2% for the ramps, 
And these are ramp downs we're talking about. Um, and then over the number of samples, so we can calculate what that megawatt ramp rate is. And I'm gonna go through um, the illustration of how we, how we get there. There's no timer up here. So it's like a voice gonna speak in <laughs> two minutes. Um, so the ramp forecast product, this is a simplified illustration. So you can kind of get a sense of how we come up with the, the ramp forecast. So this starting very simple, we have our deterministic forecast here in the, the dark uh, bolded, and then we have 10 ensemble members, okay? Then we uh, look at the maximum ramp for every hour. So at, for this particular hour at this time, I think it's four o'clock, um, we see a three hour ramp rate here, the maximum ramp rate. So we calculate this at every hour uh, given all the ensembles. So we come up with like our maximum ramp rate. So we can see illustrated here that we have all these different, yeah, for each hour, this is the three hour ramp rate. So think of it as like a composite. And I'm just simplifying here so you get an idea. And then, um, so basically the composite here for every hour, three hour, and we're also doing this at one hourly and for the eight hour as well. So the result is this ramp forecast. So looking at the X, at the Y axis here, this is the, the percent change over that three hour period. So at every hour here, we have a certain percentage change and you can see this information actually is, is quite valuable because for the, the grid operator, they wanna know when the ramp rate is really low and then they don't have to have as many units at standby. Um, so you get a composite here of the uh, three hour ramp rate. So the product description here, um, the, this, the ramping reserves are required to meet supply shortfalls. So for the ramp, the ramp up capacity for the, uh, the units that are in standby or are participating in this product. The three different horizons allow for the varying notice times required by these standby units. And uh, the one, three and eight hour as we defined before are the main products, which I'll show you in the next graphic, um, their dashboard. And here are the lead times for the short-term forecast, uh, updated 15 minute lead, then the long-term is 120 hour. And this is updated with the new weather models that they receive about four times a day. So the ramping reserve requirement is considering not only the ramp forecast we're giving, but the difference of the deterministic wind ramp forecast and the probabilistic ramp forecast. So that's the, the key the key for the reserve requirement. And it's really designed to cover the most probable ramp events. So we're talking about the 2% probability of exceedance. So um, usually a very, the very large uh, megawatt value. Okay, so for a dashboard view of what the operator sees in the control room, um, this graphic is showing megawatts in the y-axis, and then this is time x-axis. Um, if you look at the ramping margin, this is a varying case where um, there's a lot of wind on the system. So um, one way to think of this is uh, as a forecast uncertainty in this blue line. So where it's really flat, there's not a lot of variability in the wind, in the wind forecast. And where you see the green line, which is the ramping margin, meet the blue line, then you come into these situations where uh, there's a lot of uncertainty and you don't have the margins to meet it. And then you get this stoplight graphics up here. So this, these buttons at the top here are corresponding to either all, all Island, Northern Ireland, Ireland, or the Republic of Ireland. So these three different zones, and then the different products like the one hour, three hour and eight hour uh, ramping. So the, every, every time their uh, SCUC uh, optimization model runs, uh, we get a new ramping margin time series. And uh, when that gets really close to, uh, as I said, the, the ramping requirement, 
then these uh, buttons will light up and alert the operator to the situation. So the ramping margin requirement is actually determined by several factors. And one is the, the largest single in feed, so the largest generator, which currently is about 500 megawatts on their system, but also takes into account uh, adding into load forecast error and also the maximum between the ramping reserves and the forecast uncertainty. And then also take into consideration the uncertainty with the, um, the interconnection. And uh, yeah, so it, it, it is a com more complex function here. And then this is a use case where um, there's really little um, variability with the wind. So you can see that the, the uncertainty here is pretty steady. And so the, 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 the requirement is much uh, more predictable, you could say. Okay, so a little bit about um, where else we can use probabilistic forecast, um, thinking kind of in the future and what's gonna happen in Ireland, particularly where there's gonna be a lot more wind planned for the grid. Uh, they even have an ambition, I think of 75% uh, renewables by 2030. So that's pretty, uh, it's gonna be pretty interesting to see what happens with, uh, in terms of their requirements for the ramp uh, reserve, uh, ramping margin reserve when they get to these high penetration levels. But there are other applications here. Um, when we see more demand response te technologies emerge, we're gonna have a different state dependent variables that can be modeled. So this is gonna be upcoming, I'm sure, and in some places probably already real. Uh, expand the number of weather-driven grid reliability events uh, in terms of extreme temperature events or lost solar power generation from aerosols. Uh, these are more rare, rare cases, but uh, they could be modeled in, in terms of probabilistic uh, forecasts. And then also in external information that we're not yet accounting for. Uh, for example, the interconnected system renewable generation. So like Ireland is gonna have two interconnects coming online in the next four years. I think one is going to Wales and another to France, I believe. And that's gonna increase their interconnectedness to those markets with their own renewable portfolios and generation profiles. And then the state of storage for different um, uh, storage technologies, pump hydro or battery state of charge. So there are gonna be a lot of opportunities to work with uh, partners on um, providing probabilistic forecasts in the future. And it's a matter of educating and showing examples like this that are actually in use today that I think will increase the adoption. Um, so I wanna thank the, the, the folks here that I list uh, who were very uh, helpful in educating me on their current use case uh, with uh, uh, IRGRID and uh, James Ryan, who I think have, may have attended previous meetings here. And then also Overspeed, who we partner with on providing these uh, ramp forecasts to our grid. Great, uh, that's all I have. Um, I, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, you got done well in time as I was even trying to turn my video on. Uh, so again, absolutely appreciate uh, you sharing uh, the uh, sharing the experiences of uh, IRGRID, the Irish uh, PSO with us. It is very uh, it was very encouraging to see how they had converted such a uh, what could what is considered a very math intensive, probability intensive problem statement into a very simplistic uh, visual for the control room in terms of knowing what was their risk level. Um, so I appreciate seeing that. I'm certain uh, we'll have much more discussion here later on. I, with that said, I, it's I see Amber is getting ready. So we'll transition over uh, and invite uh, Amber to come in. 
uh, and, and share with us experiences from of California ISO. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, Amber is a uh, senior manager at uh, of short-term uh, forecasting at Cal ISO. In her current role, Amber is accountable for leading a team to perform daily forecasting responsibilities of uh, California's 27 gigawatts of solar energy, seven gigawatts of wind, and a peak demand of over 50 uh, gigawatts, 50,000 megawatts, uh, uh, with about 78,000 participating as uh, EIM entities. Uh, Amber's roles and responsibilities expand into advancing Cal ISO's formulation of the regulation requirement, flexible resource adequacy, flexible ramp requirement, including avenues to integrate probabilistic forecasting into market optimization. Amber has a Bachelor of Science in Meteorology with a minor in Hydrology from St. Cloud State University. With that, welcome, Amber. We are looking forward to hearing from you. What I'll try to do is uh, I'll, I'll turn on my video two minutes prior to time. I hope uh, if you can spot me, that might be the, the most least intrusive way of letting you know uh, if Perfect. your time is come close. Perfect. Well, thank you for such a great introduction. We also have a timer over here, so I'm going to use this just to make sure in top of the video, I will know how much I'm talking. Um, so thank you guys for having me today to talk a little bit about what the California ISO is doing with probabilistic forecast informing weather aware uncertainty requirements um, for the different products that we have of our renewable free fleet. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about KISO, where we are. Um, the challenges that we're seeing in relation to the load and the demand as the growth of DER penetration has increased. In addition, um, the challenges we see with large scale renewables on the fleet. And then get into uh, the real um, bread and butter of this presentation, which is the tools that we have put in place um, on uncertainty requirements. In, in previous SIG presentations, I really dived into the details of the imbalance and the flex product requirements. So in q and I can talk about any questions you guys have there, but for today, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we've done with regulation requirement, but still touch a little bit on the two products before. And then some of the expansion of the operational forecasting products um, that we've created to give to the grid operators to help with situational awareness to commit the supply when there's more uncertainty within the renewable fleet. So many of you guys aware, uh, same slide as yesterday, so I'll go through this one pretty quickly. Um, California ISO is located in the Western United States. Um, the balancing authority operation um, is within most of California, 80% of California, a little bit of Nevada. Um, we do have the Western EIM as well, um, which you can see shaded within the orange and then the future entities to come on are shaded in blue. Uh, growth, uh, the big thing for California, and I know uh, Jeff mentioned this a little bit of overseas, we're expected to be 60% of all of the energy provided to be a qualified renewable resource by 2030, which is around the corner, um, and by 2045 have 100% of the energy provided from zero carbon resources. Uh, the graph on the left shows the growth that we've seen since 2014. Um, so this over here is 2014. This is November of 2021. So it's a little outdated, um, but you can see that the trajectory of growth, the growth has been a lot within the solar space, which you guys have heard from us before, um, but we are seeing some growth right now as well on the wind side. Uh, the current um, penetration facts, these are old already. Um, I think we hit a peak yesterday for solar. Um, so with that, um, we're over 14,000 megawatts um, on the system for solar right now. I, I suspect we'll just continue to hit peaks the next few days. So wait for all those to come out and then we'll have our new record. Um, we did hit a new wind peak this year as well at 6,265 megawatts in March. And then we've hit 103.5% on May 8th um, for renewables serving load. Our peak demand still remains in 2006 at 50,000 megawatts, but one of the things that we have seen, and we haven't quite got there, but a couple of years ago, we got close um, to this peak of 50,270. Um, we've been floating right around like 48, 49,000 um, most years. 
we have about um, it's over, this is November data. Um, so we have probably closer to 600 individual re renewable resource IDs that we're forecasting for. Um, and, and this number is a little higher as well, but um, 22,000 megawatts of large scale renewables and about 13,000 megawatts of behind the meter solar. So what are the challenges we're facing when you have a system that's so renewable dependent? So one of the things that you see, and we have a lot of weather individuals in the, in the crowd today, is that the weather variables such as cloud cover, temperatures, um, and <clears throat> smoke impact um, are introducing uncertainty components to multiple variables of the power system. That can include both the supply side um, and the demand side. So it's impacting both sides of the equation. The load forecast gets impacted because the behind the meter solar, especially 13,000 megawatts of solar is impacted. But then the large scale renewable are also impacted um, on the wind and the solar production. Uh, KISO, like the other grid operators, still use a deterministic, a point clearing process with deterministic point forecasts in the optimization. Um, and that's important to note um, so what we've done to assist with that is create different products uh, as well as procedures to assist in accounting for those uncertainties. And some of those products are optimized in the market to make sure that we're committing additional supply um, to handle the movement of the renewables, um, but also created products to communicate to operations during key times um, the risk to the supply system so they can make commitment decisions if they need to. Some operational impacts, um, need for flexibility. You need the resources to move and we need them to move quickly. So you'll hear a lot of KISO members say, we, need a, we have a need for speed. Um, and we do see that. Um, we have a lot of batteries coming on that, that do provide that for us. Um, regulation requirements, you need smarter regulation proc requirement procurement. And I'll talk about that more later. Uh, regional granularity. Um, one of the things that we've seen is previously we would have three um, forecast load forecast regions underneath forecasting the KISO total load. We've needed to recently break that down to six. So as the penetration of the renewables has grown, we've needed to break the granularity of the load forecast up to make sure that the transmission side and the market side are optimizing non congestion the best that they can. We've had added uncertainty on the system. So what does that ultimately do to operations? Um, these two um, controls, area control error, ACE and CPS1 control performance standard one are things that we have as two as a grid operator operate to for the NERC requirements. Um, and so it makes operating these two a little bit more difficult. So to transition a little bit into tools, um, there's a suite of tools that we've been putting in place. Um, today, I'm going to focus mostly on the requirement products. Um, so the real-time flex ramp requirement enhancements. I know you guys heard John um, talk about it, or Ben talk about it a little bit yesterday, as well as uh, the proposed imbalance reserve requirement. This is in the stakeholder process right now, in addition to the regulation requirements. So what are the products that we've put into the market to assist with the uncertainty. So one of the things that I always like to describe is the timeline. So how do these products work together? The products work together in relation to time. So imbalance is imbalance requirements in the proposed design is to look at the time frame of the day ahead forecast to the FMM forecast. So you guys are like, what is FMM? 15 minute market, but in relation to time frame. It's about 45 minutes from actual. So day ahead forecasts come out about 9 a.m. day prior, and the FMM forecasts or the 15 minute market forecasts come out about 45 minutes prior to actual. The, the proposed method for that is using quantile regression, um, which is some of the enhancements that we made to our current histogram approach to put weather um, into the uncertainty uh, requirement formulation. Then you move to flex ramp requirements. This is currently in production right now. Um, it uses a histogram approach. Um, there's the proposal and enhancement for this fall it to move to the quantile regression to also incorporate weather um, into its formulation. So its time frame is the 15 minute market. So 45 minutes out 
to RTD, real-time dispatch, which is about 10 minutes out. And then you get to regulation requirements, which is really the last requirement product. And that takes you from the last market run, which is RTD, which is about 10 minutes out, to actual on the system. And then the, we'll talk more about the, the method that's used for the regulation requirements, but it's, it's a combination. Um, as you can see, I know you guys don't, you can't see the scales on here because the pictures are small, but you have more megawatts in the day ahead timeframe. Um, this is about 4,000 megawatts right here on the up and the down. So you see the need of more uncertainty in the day ahead timeframe, that makes sense. And then as we get into real time, it gets slightly smaller. So when we get into real time here, the bigger spikes are around a thousand. Um, so Kaisa proposed the use of the quantile regression to calculate the net load uncertainty requirements. We did this in uh, 2018, I think. Um, currently, we use a histogram methodology, so very statistically based, um, to procure capacity products like the real-time flexing flex ramp product. One of the things that it didn't do is it does look at the forecast from the 45 minute out period to the 10 minute out period to see how the forecast is moving, but it didn't incorporate weather. So it wasn't saying, well, this is what it moved and it moved on a day that was partly cloudy. Um, so that's the big piece that we've proposed is putting quantile regression in place so that we can uh, capture the load wind and solar um, components and the different pieces underneath of them um, to do weather awareness. What is quantile regression? Um, quantile regression estimates the quantiles of that dependent variable um, that you're trying to look at. So if your dependent variable is solar, for instance, it's trying to estimate the regret, the quantiles of that variable of solar to set um, on the condition to set the variables in the independent space. Um, it's preferred in the imbalance reserve and the real-time flex ramp requirements. Um, right now, it's proposed um, that we will have a 95th percentile. So you got 2.5 on the bottom and 2.5 on the top. So we'll control to 2.5% and 97.5% of the net load imbalances um, as opposed to the average of the net load um, imbalances. And then the most important piece of quantile regression, which is different than the histogram approach, is the regressors. So the regressors that are currently proposed to go into both of the requirement products include load, solar, and wind megawatt values. So we've chosen right now not to use the weather variable, but the megawatt variable that shows what the weather did um, to the resources. Um, that will be by operating hour and by month. Uh, what's a little uh, snapshot between uh, the two products? So the imbalance reserve product is an hourly product. Um, it does take into account, one of the things um, you've seen is as we have solar on the system and solar ramps very quickly during sunrise and sunset, is that when you look at an hourly average forecast and you get to what is essentially a four second instantaneous point that you need to control to, you need to take into consideration the fact that the day ahead market's optimizing on hourly averages. And once you get to the 15 minute market, it's a 15 minute. Um, so we're gonna put that into the formulation of the imbalance reserve product as well to make sure we can take into a consideration the ramp difference that happens when you're doing an hourly average versus a 15 minute average. Um, and it will cover the granularity difference between the day head market and the FMM, which is about 45 minutes out. It's also going to be a biddable um, parameter, and the awards are going to be co-optimized um, within the system. Real-time flex ramp product is in real-time. It's a 15-minute product. It's five-minute dispatchable versus 15-minute dispatchable. This is not a biddable parameter um, at this time, and it covers the uncertainty um, from that five-minute period to 10 uh, and then it does have a demand curve for the uncertainty um, that's in there. And in the demand curve talk, we could go um, all over um, for a long time. Oh, we'll wait. I think I'm at two minutes too. Um, the one thing that you can see with the quantiles, I really like this graph. So this is a, a representation of what the quantiles do. So the histogram approach, so this is a bunch, blues all the observations 
of the forecast differences between FMM and RTD. And these two different pieces show all the dots and it kind of, so quantile shows the green line, it shows the curvature, it can capture the curvature. So if the forecast is in the middle, which is a partly cloudy situation, you see you have more uncertainty. If it's low clouds, no clouds, less uncertainty. If it's high penetration, you have less uncertainty where histogram is just setting it as a straight, a straight line. I'm going to move a little quick because I think I only have a couple minutes left. This slide um, came from EPRI, and I know they presented it yesterday, which talked a little bit about what is behind the scenes of the probabilistic forecast to give us the different range of the uncertainty. But I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, reg requirements. Um, so this is something that Kaiso put in place the first rendition in 2016, and we've refined it, I think, three or four times since then with the last refinement going in last year. Um, we're using ACE star, so ACE, uh, the area control error um, in a one minute data where we can't, so we're not muting any streams and then adding in the regulation that's dispatched. So we uh, tune the historical data set. You wanna make sure that that historical data set you're using to form the requirements is reflective of the weather conditions that are coming. Most of the time we're using the most recent 30 days in combination of the same month last year. So if we're in June, we're looking at June's last year's requirement in combination to the last 30 days to make sure we can capture some of the growth we are seeing in the renewables and what they've done overall to ACE and regulation dispatch. We take the max between those. So we run them separately to see what happens. And then we take the max requirement um, between those two pieces at different percentiles. So we look at the 95th percentile on less volatile days, whether it be cloud cover that's really moving the system or re renewable winds that are moving the system. And then we change that and be less risk adverse um, when we're in more volatile forecast conditions. To get to the 90, when the decision of when we use the 95th versus the 98th, we're using the probabilistic forecasts. So we are using the probabilistic forecasts that are coming from the vendors as well as um, the renewal or the load side of it to see how much error we could expect within our forecasts as a total. And then the meteorologist makes the decision of, I, I see the forecasted error during this time being you know, more and then they will um, change the percentile. We can change it outside these two percentiles as well, but we've mostly have been operating between 95th and 98th for right now. Um, so it's really a combination approach of using the statistical data that's available to you, but also using the probabilistic forecasts to assume how much risk you wanna take on in the reg market during that day. This is done in the day ahead time frame. And then lastly, I think, yep. Um, we have uh, created a lot of probabilistic forecasts or what I call confidence bands. Um, so ultimately the difference of what a probabilistic forecast is used for is when you have to commit supply that's outside of what the market sees. So when do you need to commit the supply with on the system that the market didn't commit? So we provide Confidence bands for load every single day to the operations team. These are not just a straight statistical product. These are based off of different weather conditions that could happen on the behind the meter solar side. These are based off of different temperature conditions that we have risks to on both the upper and the lower side of it. In addition, um, during certain key risk situations, we provide solar and wind confidence bands. We have two renewable providers that are feeding the system for both solar and wind. Um, so we look at the combination of their forecasts, their probabilistic bands in combination. Sometimes we'll even put out what we call an STF recommended. So if we think that the vendor's forecast may be too high or maybe too low for whatever reason, whatever scenario we're going into, you, you'll see sometimes the team will form a green line and say, this is, if I was to do the forecast today, this is what I would wanna see. Um, and we provide those to operations during key situations so that they can make the right decisions on when to commit their supply as they go through the system. And with that, 
I will pass it on to my partner um, to talk a little bit more about the Siemens system and how we've integrated the imbalance requirement, the flex ramp requirement, and into the optimization of the market. Thank you very much for that very uh, interesting uh, uh, set of slides. And I'm very intrigued by all, how you've into, you're looking to integrate or you have integrated probabilistic forecasts and even setting your reserve requirements for a day. Uh, uh, I mean, that, that combined with how you are and uh, how you put together communications to the control room around the various uncertainties is very, very interesting. So very happy to hear that. And with that, we will transition to and invite Sankaran uh, to come in and share with us uh, all, all of the evolution that the, 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 the core or the, that the, the EMS and MMS have made uh, in Siemens's end. So I mean, if you haven't, I, I should mention this. What we have in front today, the panel is a, a panel of veterans who've been in the industry for so long, and likely most of you know many of these. Uh, the pa the panel uh, today that is in front of you. So Sankran is currently a senior director in business solutions for energy markets. He works out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. He's actively engaged in Cal ISO's MMS as their program manager for Siemens System. He's been engaged uh, uh, in, uh, in engaged in implementation of Philippines MMS, uh, FPL, uh, generation optimization, and market participate uh, market participant energy market solutions, as well as grid reliability software solutions for uh, uh, for the two decades that he's been uh, for over two decades that he's been a part of this industry. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Sankran has a PhD uh, from Iowa State in electrical engineering. And he's a regular volunteer teacher for Sundays, uh, for, uh, on Sundays for children. So when he's not working on for solving the problems of the energy industry, he's helping out uh, children. With that, Sankran, welcome. Uh, uh, please take the stage and uh, uh, walk us through your slides. Looking forward to uh, hearing from you. Thank you, Nitika. Uh, Amber did an excellent job of introducing different products and how it's tied to the forecast uncertainty. So that kind of gives me an idea what I should cover and uh, what I should, uh, you know, don't have to in this particular set of slides. Let me quickly, okay. So what I want to do this morning is uh, go through how is uncertainty managed in a holistic view, you know, that's a, all the way from planning to now, dispatch is going on and, and so forth. <laughs> and uh, actually for this kind of a hybrid session that Charlie introduced uh, since last time, and I learned a lot from the forecast folks. Finally, I figured out from uh, Pascal and Nick and Gary, it's not the crystal ball, guys. <laughs> it's really, you know, how more the work that goes into forecast gives me, you know, so much confidence. And because we all have gone through so much gyrations of uh, forecasts and the results and seeing the performance of our own applications over a period of time. So, you know, so there's a lot of respect that, you know, we get for the forecast. And the least I can do is do a reciprocity of return a little bit of it, <laughs> how the systems are working the way it is and how different aspects fit in so that our conversation and dialogue is extremely productive for each other. So with that, and then the current solution, a quick overview and talk about so many other drivers of influence going on besides the forecast somewhat pushes us to do in a certain way. What are they? Visit them. And then take uh, a certain overview of a six-year journey in California. You know, uh, uh, Amber rightly said, "Speed matters in California. <laughs> speed matters. You know, everything is at a head-spinning speed." <laughs> and you know, that journey, a quick, uh, you know, what all the stops we went through, that kind of thing. And uh, 
go through a small use case type of a example, which I think is not needed anymore because these points have been discussed over and over. So I don't think there's a lot, any much value in it. And so other than conclusion, some thoughts that I would like to exchange. That's that's the way, that's the way I thought this presentation would be. And the laser pointer, okay, I got it. There are no cats here, good. <laughs> the planning studies is where you start. This is the time equals zero plus is right here, the bottom. And you know the planning studies that go on year, quarter, month, as you expect. Week ahead reviews, week ahead reviews, think of it as a, somewhat of a draft. It's a rolling draft. Seven days from now, six days from now, five days from now, you're counting down some drafts, if you will, uh, for that day. And then the day ahead market, and there is also the week ahead reviews gotten a lot of new meaning with high renewables. We'll come to that. And the day ahead market, you know, tomorrow and every hour, and the intraday, next few hours. And what is look ahead contingency analysis? All of these are situation awareness that defines the situation as of now. Also, next few hours, somewhat gives you a preview of how is the ride going to be like? This is what you're going to have. This is the ride that's going to be for the next hours of the day. So that gives you the entire feeling of it. The real-time market, hour, 15 minutes, five minutes, we talked about it. And on the EMS side, there are status simulator, contingency analysis, load frequency control. We talked about CPS one and two, and the distribution management systems have distributed energy resource forecast. In all of the work we do up here is finally to make sure I am ready, whatever is going to happen. That's all. Everything is trust rehearsals, drafts, and then you get there. Think of it that way. So, so much work that goes on in the back rooms before we get here. Other couple of points to say is when you account for the net load uncertainty, we already, you all already know, we talk about net load, not just the load or renewables. Uh -huh. And the use of probability forecast, you know, in this session, many conversations have happened. I want you to be aware of other uncertainties that can collide together, such as, and I expected a lot of renewables, very less renewable, and I already planned a schedule outage through two hours from now, your transmission line is going to pull out. Uh-oh, a look ahead analysis will tell you, don't do it. <laughs> so these kind of things, right? So schedule outages drift in time. Sometimes we force them to drift deliberately for certain reasons. Unscheduled outages. This is where North American Electric Reliability Council got some strict rules. Any element pulls out. If a transmission line pulls out, that may have 20 generators behind it. They're all gone. If that happens, get your show under control in 10 minutes. That's the rule, right? 10 minute rule. In the US, there's a 30 minute rule. If any transmission trip, doesn't matter. It's 500 kV, 230 kV, 100 miles long, 10 miles long, irrelevant. If it pulls out, you got 30 minutes to get your show under control, okay? All of this, if you don't do it, there are penalties. And worse yet, it's like a death squad. You may have to sit in a congressional hearing. So, <laughs> so that, it'll be that bad. So uh, people have done it, remember. So, so this is how the whole scheme is. Now we can go into different aspects of it. So planning, so I, I've spent a lot of my time, my graduate school time and so forth in the transitability and so forth. You know, those are a lot of backroom work goes on. There's Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, three years from now, a bunch of coal generators are gone. Uh, no more of uh, certain uh, nuclear generators. Uh, five gigawatt of solar coming in or all kinds of, you know, one gigawatt of storage coming in. What happens? This is the integrated resource plan, generation, transmission, distribution. You go over it and Generally, you don't worry about the variability, but you worry about it in a different way. High renewable case, very low renewable case. If it's a high renewable case, I need to have a lot of flexible capacity, meaning capacities that can quickly get in, deployable, provide energy versus slow ones. 
in the low uh, renewable energy case, you need to have a lot of resources that can be made available, resource adequacy and all of that come into play. So think of it that way, system strength. Now it's becoming very important. And as a tangible stability major, I know what it means. Oftentimes, you don't need any control systems. In the old days, inertia is managed. Some problem happens, inertia is readjust. Then you come and put on a control to readjust it. The inertia doesn't wait for you. It doesn't, you don't need to tell it what to do. It takes care of it. It's kind of like water flowing from higher elevation to the lower elevation. You don't need to do a damn thing, right? It's physics. But those days are gone, right? Remember, what are you going to do? System stability assessment. And on the middle, operation planning, you have the forward market clearing, schedules and prices. This is for tomorrow. This is where we split the problem. One is energy for expected average values. Then comes the reserve. That's where you prepare for uncertainty. Think of it in finance for a business. I have a current account, the balanced account, checking account, and I have a reserve line, right? Like that, think of it that way. There's a reserve line and there's a checking account. That's your energy clearing second to second. Selected reserves, use of probabilistic forecast. We talked about it quite a bit. Scenarios. In some of the markets, we do multiple scenarios. It could be tied to the probability, however you set it up. It can be 10% renewable down, more, not, you know, minus 10%, plus 10%, demand plus 5%, minus 5%. Then they look at how the resource availability planning point of view. Next week, they'll check all week. Example, right? And outage evaluation becomes important because the studies I did two weeks ago to clear an outage, those base case conditions might have varied drastically. I got to redo all of it every day, next week, next seven days I'll look at. That's outage evaluation. Then comes the real-time operations. So, uh, for, for example, uh, you know, we talked about the probability basis for selected reserve, like ramp reserve, regulation, and so forth. And comes this look ahead, skid, uh, look ahead sked. Already, Jeff introduced you to SCUT, SCUC. So, you think of it as security constraint economic dispatch, looking at the horizon of next hour, for example. Break it to five minutes. And each five minutes, it's trying to schedule energy. Each 15 minute time frame, when you look at it, it's scheduling reserves, you know, some other flexible capacity. I may increase in a generator, I may decrease in some generator, all of these are done. Then also think of it as ramping is uh, what? Rate of change. Dynamic ramping between one five minute to other five minute, think of it as a second derivative now. The ramp rate itself changes, right? So you need to look at, is it possible now? Is it possible for me to go for the second derivative in the next cycle and the cycle after? Suppose if your ramping reserve is increasing, 100, 150, 200. You need to look at it and can I do the rate of change also, right? So all of these get involved into those look ahead type techniques. Then comes the six seconds balancing. We'll come to that. Network analysis, we talk about a look ahead contingency analysis. This is the same thing. There is excursion of renewables and over the period of time for different contingencies, how will the grid be have? On the behind the meter, rooftop clusters forecast is uh, there's a lot of work going on in metadata management systems. Balancing, this is where the NERC CPS criteria comes into play. Frequency, area control error, penalties for non-compliance. And the errors are absolute errors. They sum up the absolute errors over a year, for example. 
and there are penalties if you don't you know, accomplish the standards. And then the products for flexibility, there are so many other factors come into play. FERC 755 came and said, I'll make bonus payments for fast acting resources. 841 for storage is connected to the grid. 2222, the distributed energy resources are uh, how they're going to be engaged in the wholesale market. In 2016, if you recall, the Supreme Court ruling that allowed wholesale can take the retail for demand response. Finally, we are in FERC 2222. That's going to be a game changer. And there are production incentives, tax incentives, IAJA, net zero. The supply side of flexibility is moving pretty fast. <laughs> And EIM storages, energy imbalance market, for example. I have surplus of renewable energy, then I can sell it on a five minute basis. Prior to that, we could sell it only in an hourly basis. Now on a five minute basis, I can sell my surplus. If I have deposit, I can take it. So these come in the average values, some sense. Whereas the batteries are governors of generators, those can respond to variability six seconds or primary frequency control within a second. So put together, that's a technology assist. On the reserve management, essentially you keep replenishing how much reserve you need and replenish or take it away, all of those decisions happen. Sankaran, if you could try to wrap up down to about a couple minutes. Okay. You said what, two, two minutes or? Couple minutes, yes. Right. Thank you. So I'm almost there anyway. Yeah. So this is a picture of 2015. This is 2021. And you know these are the spring and summer related net loads. Of course, the belly is sinking, the ramp is raising, and various changes that went into the system are here. And a couple of them, I would say, the smart use of forecast, you know, we covered, Amber was covering it, and the EIM, outage optimization, the look ahead contingency analysis, these are all highlights. The dynamic ramping is a must since you are looking at all those ramps that coming in the, what you call no cast and all of that <laughs> within four hours, you need those kind of uh, second rate of change models and so forth. The capacity prices increased from 2018 to 2020. Why? In 2020, gas price was much lower than 18 and 19. Still, the ancillary service cost, which is a rent, which has nothing to do with the energy, just the rent you pay for reserves and capacities, that as a percentage of energy cost went up roughly 30%. When the fuel prices pretty much came down 30%. So now you can think, you know, it's almost like a 60% increase in capacity prices, which is what you would expect in the grid. And this has been discussed in many different uh, sessions already. And uh, you know, this essentially, this is the probability related confidence band. How do you decide how much upper uncertainty requirement or lower uncertainty requirement you decide and so forth. We had quite a few sessions in it. I wouldn't go through it. The point is our job as a solution provider is all of you to pick different settings and variable settings, five minutes could be a different value, next five minutes would be a different value. That's our challenge. The rest of it is uh, that is left to Amber and her colleagues in terms of how much it is. Is it 97.5% quartile or what is it, you know? Yeah. 
couple of points I wanted to mention. You know, the energy imbalance market itself is an interesting work. Think of it, renewable is a generation. And previously, I could schedule energy in one hour. All of a sudden, within five minutes, if I can give my surplus to somebody, I converted that to a demand. Think of that, right? So I said demand, it became a demand. So uh, all of these for 22 is uh, shaving. The demand is not enough. Can you shape the demand? So that's where we are moving. So this is a statement I picked up from one of the conference, moving from a world where we forecast load and schedule generation, we are increasingly moving to a world where we forecast generation and schedule load. The generation, as you know, today, some of the generation can be converted to demand quickly. Some of the load, as you know, today, the batteries getting charged can be converted to generation quickly. So it's mixed all over. Both depend on location and probability forecast. Think about that. That's the moment we are in. That's the game changer we are in. That's a ride we are going to take. And these are, uh, some highlights are system strength. It's a big deal. Make no mistakes. If there's no inertia on the grid, a lot of ugly things can happen. How are you going to manage it? Other one, the DER dispatch will be a game changer. There's no question. Long-term storage, it's going to happen. We started talking about it. Your polar vertex in the mid Midwest, in two weeks, you may not have any wind at all. Okay, just remember that. And same way, the solar can get into trouble for two full weeks in a row. So you decide how long is a long-term storage. Is one week, two weeks? Somewhere in that ballpark. So, so all of this is going to happen. Hydrogen becomes important. So Sanjay. that's the concluding note. And thank you very much for the occasion. And thank you, Charlie, for thinking of uh, doing this uh, bridge type of a session. It's extremely valuable for all the sites. Thank you all. And Sankran, thank you very much uh, for the very thoughtful uh, presentation um, on how we should be looking at the challenges uh, these net load uncertainties bring. What we'll do is we are running a little behind, so I'll quickly transition in and invite Tolu uh, from the New York ISO uh, to come in and uh, present uh, to us how New York ISO has been working on integrating uh, probabilistic forecasts into their operations. Uh, Tolu is a uh, the manager of operations performance and analysis, and uh, he has over 13 years of experience in the power industry. He leads uh, two departments uh, at the New York ISO, one that deals with market validation and the other that does operations analysis. Tolu has is very well educated, has a BS uh, uh, in, electrical, in electrical and electronics engineering from University of Lagos, Nigeria, a master in science and of elect in electrical engineering from CSU Sacramento, and an MBA from sunny New York, uh, Albany. So with that, Tolu, uh, if, you, if you don't mind taking over, and I, I will try to give you a time check. Uh, if you can, try to stay within 15 minutes, that will try to give us back, get us back on track. Sure thing. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, the slides here. Um, so first, go over a quick overview of the roles of the NISO in the New York control area, um, responsible for reliable operation of the bulk grid, uh, manage the wholesale electricity markets, and also responsible for planning New York's energy future. Uh, for those who are in touch with state policies, that also includes the uh, Climate Protection Act, uh, the state plans to enact with 70% of generation in New York State by 2035 uh, coming from renewables and 100% of energy in the state being emissions free by 2040. Uh, just another chart here by the numbers, uh, giving an overview of the footprints, market participants in the states, 
uh, our peak demand back in 2013, summer peak, 33,956 megawatts. Uh, back in 2020, uh, 50 from renewables uh, counted for 27%. Luke, uh, going to the next slide here, just giving a representation of uh, the fuel mix in the state versus uh, the uh, energy production, uh, contrasting 2021 versus 2020. Um, uh, the key takeaway here is um, even though from a capacity perspective, we do have 70% of resources based on fossil fuels, when you look at the energy production, we're getting uh, just 43% out of those resources and the balance is being made from uh, zero emissions and other resources. That's good, Tulu. You're coming through loud and clear now. That's great. Uh, next slide, just going to a brief overview of the energy markets uh, in New York. It's a full two settlement market for energy reserves and regulation. Um, we have our day ahead uh, with our security constraint unit commitments and our real-time commitment and real-time dispatch, where we simultaneously to optimize energy and ancillary products to minimize total production costs. Uh, does include shortage pricing for reserves and regulation, and does allow for demand side resource participation. On the slide here also, we have just a timeline of how the day ahead and real-time markets interact, the timelines for uh, offer submission to day ahead market, uh, which is by 5 a.m. Uh, when the schedules are uh, posted, which is by 11 a.m. of the prior day, and then how that transitions into uh, real-time commitment and real-time dispatch timelines. Um, and just to close the loop on that, you know, day ahead market, you know, this issue is binding for contracts to the suppliers and the loads based on the locally based marginal prices. Um, and this is what transitions into the real-time commitment, which runs every 15 minutes, uh, optimizing over a two and a half hour period. And then this segues into a real-time dispatch, which is running every five minutes, optimizing over a 60 minute period. And this is where we issue dispatch instructions for units to operate. Now getting more into the forecasting, um, so we do utilize vendors to generate our power forecasts for wind and solar resources. Um, from the very beginning of integrating intermittent resources into the bulk grid in New York, uh, we had required meteorological data to be transmitted from these resources to NISO, at which point they are passed over to our forecaster to use to train the numerical models. Uh, this has been key in assisting those models to improve the accuracy over time. Uh, these resources also, uh, as with everywhere else, are required to send us telemetry every six seconds. Um, they are required to put in the offers in the real-time markets. Uh, in the day ahead, it is optional. Um, so with the inputs from the meteorological data, the meter readings uh, all being sent to the forecaster, the forecaster is able to generate uh, real-time power forecasts for wind and grid-connected or FTM solar resources. And that data feeds back to NISO markets and generates real-time base points for intermittent resources. Uh, for our behind-the-meter solar resources, that's currently integrated into the NISO's load forecasting tools. So that is being forecasted and applied to the gross load to come up with a net load value. Um, talking more about the integration into the uh, day ahead markets, um, the forecast that we uh, received, uh, as mentioned on an earlier slide before the 5 a.m. In initialization of the dam. Um, this forecast I input into day ahead market uh, passes and we saw for forecasted load in the forecast pass. Uh, in the bid pass, only generators that provided financial offers would be considered. Uh, like, as I said, this uh, contrast the forecast pass where uh, the general forecast for all uh, IPR resources are used. In the real-time market, uh, we're getting the power forecast for intermittent resources every 15 minutes. Um, if I didn't mention before, these are deterministic forecasts. Um, 
the means in which they are to offer is as flexible resources and their economic upper limits should reflect their full nameplate capabilities and the market software adjusts the forecast with the time step uh, with a blend in, in initial near term as persistence and over time the 60 minute horizon blends in higher percentages of the forecast with the persistence that gets to uh, a full forecast value. And here's just a graphic indicating the uh, methodology of the blending from uh, the binding or Im uh, immediate pass and over the advisory passes between the persistence and the forecast values. Um, we do track the performance of our intermittent forecast from our vendor. Uh, this forecast, our deterministic forecast uh, that are optimized to minimize the MAE, the mean absolute error. Um, here's just a chart from uh, the NISO operations monthly reports uh, showing the hour ahead uh, error and bias uh, for uh, wind in this case. Uh, overall intervals on the month and on the right for intervals with uh, significant ramps observed. Uh, and, and takeaway basically is we do see uh, that the goal of minimizing the MAE uh, is typically under 4% uh, across all months of the year. Um, we do get an over and under on the bias. Um, that's typically due to um, outages uh, taken by the wind farms as they uh, perform maintenance and that's not always captured in the forecast and does introduce a bias from time to time. And with regards to ramp period performance, uh, we continue to see that the forecast uh, as expected from the vendor does uh, provide uh, better quality forecast from an MAE perspective than persistence during significant ramps. Um, in the EMS systems of view for operators is just a snapshot of one of the many displays that the operator is able to view, uh, giving them a quick snapshot of solar and wind across the states, uh, forecasts, forecast errors, uh, and the trend over time. Uh, likewise, here's another display just uh, zooming in on just a specific uh, IPR resource, in this case, a, a wind resource, uh, just showing a couple of key metrics for the system operators to see, which include uh, some of the meteorological data that's provided from the assets, the wind speed, direction and temperature, and uh, the uh, forecasts over the time horizon. And here's a similar one for solar. Uh, this is done at the zonal aggregation level um, for a quick, easy snapshot for the system operators to review. Uh, next, just want to go over some ongoing developments at the NISO. Uh, two key ones I want to go over. Uh, Cosro in the next presentation will go over a fuller suite of uh, developments uh, they're taking at on uh, from projects going through the stakeholders here in New York. But don't highlight uh, one of the effects of everyone really is the order 2222 DERs and how the aggregations of IPRs are going to be forecasted. Uh, right now, our, our proposal includes forecasting them. These are aggregations of homogeneous intermittent resources, uh, similar to traditional resources. Uh, standalone resources where we use the deterministic forecast. And then we also have a second project uh, considering dynamic operating reserves. And this effort is looking at expanding uh, the definition of uh, single source contingencies, such as simultaneous reduction of offshore wind. Uh, as mentioned, as part of the state's public policy, we're expecting um, several thousand of offshore wind installations, many of them already being awarded, uh, coming in downstate region, New York City and Long Island. Um, it's likely that those projects will create one or more new single large, larger source contingencies for the state of New York. And currently our scheduling 
uh, wind resources based on this on a deterministic forecast, uh, as I mentioned, that is uh, optimized to minimize the MAE. However, uh, we are very aware that wind resources that are close to each other from a geographic proximity perspective will likely be susceptible to, susceptible to common weather, uh, which poses a risk of simultaneous loss. So this is basically um, looking at how to deal with a scenario where we have a simultaneous cutouts of one or more offshore wind farms uh, in close proximity to each other. And this is where we said to uh, come up with this proposal to use a higher confidence or probability of exceedance forecast um, to as a proposal to determine the certainty of output from these resources and using the difference between a uh, yet to be defined uh, high POE forecast and the deterministic, deterministic forecast to create a reserve product that over time would account for uh, those scenarios where we have a common weather source loss event and this will go into a dynamic reserve calculation to determine the at-risk energy from wind uh, in this scenario. This will be applicable not just to uh, the future offshore wind resources, but can be applied to uh, land-based wind resources we have now that are um, located with the same geographical region. So that's it for the ongoing developments. I think at this point, that's the end of the slides. I should be able to hand it over to Cosro uh, as a nice segue into the vendor perspective in New York. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Tolu, uh, for that very stirring presentation. Uh, it was very uh, interesting to see all of the tools you've put in place currently. And I'm looking forward to seeing the, uh, the, the project around the dynamic operating reserves and how you end up defining uh, or how you end up working through the challenge of trying to define your reserves around a, uh, around a, a, a common mode failure contingency, which is all, uh, related to weather. So we're looking forward to seeing how things evolve at your end. And with this, we will segue to our last presenter, our last panelist for today uh, is Dr. Kosro Muslehi. He's the director of product management at Hitachi Energy with focus on electric market management systems. Dr. Moslehi has over 30 years of experience in research and development in power system analysis and optimization, operation scheduling, system integration, autonomous systems, energy markets, and smart grids. Dr. Moslehi has a PhD uh, from University of Berkeley. So with that, I'll, I'll hand over uh, the, the, the session to Dr. Moslehi. Please take it away. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nitika. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Kazro. Can you put it in presenter mode for us? Sure. Okay. That's what I'm doing right now. So let me, does it look okay now? Yes, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you again, Nikita. And also uh, thanks to ESRG for the opportunity to present. Um, my presentation today will uh, focus on a market management system uh, perspective of the uh, panel uh, uh, topic. Uh, I'll uh, start with the uh, uh, an overview of the uh, grid transformation and uh, uh, as part of that integration of renewables and intermittent resources uh, into the markets and uh, the challenges uh, these integration has presented us. And uh, then I'll discuss uh, how we meet these challenges and uh, at the end I'll summarize. Uh, as part of that, I will also share with you some of the activities, whether the development or, uh, or uh, uh, collaborative R&D with New York guys, so I'll share it. Okay, so first a few words about Hitachi Energy. Uh, Hitachi Energy uh, principally is what uh, ABB uh, 
uh, what used to be ABB uh, power grids. Uh, it's a leading uh, uh, provider of uh, uh, digital and hardware solutions and services uh, to the utility industries and other industries. There are four uh, uh, business units and uh, one of them grid automation, that's where energy management systems and uh, market management system uh, operation results. Uh, grid operation is, is, a, is a leading provider of uh, uh, IT, OT solutions uh, uh, to the utility industry from, uh, I would say, sensors all the way up to uh, system, uh, plant and system level. So with that, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, start with the grid transformation. So uh, we're trying a major uh, transformation of the grid started back in the 1990s and uh, that was uh, uh, restructuring uh, where uh, the electricity markets were created and uh, ISOs and RTOs uh, 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 and also TSOs uh, overseas were, were created to, to manage the, the market and the systems. And that was followed by uh, what we call changing utility landscape as a result of uh, uh, rising deployment of uh, renewables and smart grid uh, resources. And that uh, resulted uh, changing, uh, I would say, resource characteristics, uh, seeing a lot more uh, intermittency in the network. So uh, again, that was followed uh, in the 2010s, I would say, with the rise of uh, distributed energy resources that uh, kind of introduced a new phenomenon. That was a two-way flows uh, whether it's within a distribution system or between the distribution system and the transmission systems. And then, of course, uh, that exchange has uh, led to what is now we call uh, transactive energy. Uh, so this transformation and integration of uh, uh, renewables and intermittent resources has presented us with uh, many challenges. Uh, of course, uh, primary is stochasticity. Well, we have uh, uh, we see increasing uh, uh, uncertainty in load and generation. Uh, forecasting has become more difficult, uh, and then uh, at the same time, you see a, a non-alignment of uh, generation and, and, and load, uh, where there is uh, uh, renewable generation that we may or may not need. Uh, we talk about uh, people, some people refer to it as a dock, uh, as an ind indicative of it. Uh, uh, something more significant is uh, 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 more stress on the transmission system. I mean, uh, we see a lot uh, higher and more volatile uh, flows across the grid. Uh, just uh, this week, I saw news that in China, despite the fact they're building massive transmission systems, and of course, at the same time, renewables. Uh, the renewables now exceeding what uh, their transmission system can actually handle. So that, that, that's an issue everywhere now. So increasing number of uh, smaller resources. Yes, as, as we, the, 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 the grid, the resources are becoming more distributed. We have more uh, higher number of them in the system. And uh, with uh, so many uh, resources uh, uh, interfacing with the system through these uh, uh, inverters, uh, then we see uh, problems with inertia, uh, lower uh, system inertia. So all in all, uh, looking at these various challenges, uh, this whole uh, contention between efficiency and reliability is actually accentuated. This is something that the system operators and market operators are concerned about and our solutions have to, to, to basically handle those. So how do we meet these challenges? And that's really the, 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 the crux of this discussion here. Of course, better forecasting uh, and uh, high, uh, basically, uh, uh, I remember Jeff mentioned uh, about forecasting uh, and how they apply it in, in the system in Ireland. By the way, the Ireland system, the market system that operates the system is uh, also a product from our group. So, that complexity that uh, Jeff talked about. We, we have to handle all of that within our uh, solution, uh, market solution there. Anyway, so better forecasting, of course, uh, because of uh, the nature of uh, distributed uh, resources and uh, basically the fact that this uh, intermittency has been distributed throughout the, uh, uh, the, 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 the grid. Now we, we need more uh, distributed uh, way of uh, 
forecasting and also in different layers and hierarchical. So that's given. So uh, uh, let's say we, we, we have that, that sort of forecasting, whatever accuracy we can afford. Then how do we, we, we actually run the system? Uh, so we need definitely higher levels of grid flexibility. That's really the, the, the key point. And uh, flexibility comes in different forms. And that uh, one is uh, look at capability <clears throat> and longer horizon and finer time intervals <clears throat> to, to manage, the, manage the grid. Flexibility of various resources, whether it's generation, demand, storage, uh, and, and various reserves. That, that also is part of the, the problem. And uh, uh, there is going, uh, as, as, as we see, there's increasing complexity. The way we model various uh, resources and their flexibility in, in our solutions. So that uh, also uh, uh, we talked about transmission. Uh, so trans transmission, is, uh, as, as we know, is not uh, uh, easy and not, not cheap to, to build. So whatever resources we have, we need to really optimally utilize them. And that, that requires a, a better modeling uh, of the transmission uh, grid in our, in our solutions. And at the end, uh, to have a sort of talk about uh, uh, efficiency versus reliability. We need to have all these um, uh, sort of resources modeled properly and at the same time co-optimized. So that is even a larger and more complex problems. And that all translates to uh, we need a higher performance scheduling and market clearing uh, solutions. As, as, and as time goes by, these complexities and demand for uh, computational uh, power actually increases. So with that, uh, look at capability. Uh, whether it's a, a, a sort of a North American type of uh, market, which we call them uh, central dispatch, or it's a more uh, balancing system, the types that uh, are uh, prevalent in Europe. Uh, uh, actually, the, the, the operation basically is basically based on a multi-interval optimal scheduling and dispatch. It's our system in Ireland, more or less, very similar to what uh, we do in the US. Uh, so uh, you have a data scheduling or a market, and then you have intraday adjustment and then real time. Now, of course, you do have also reliability scheduling where, where you do multi-week or multi-day uh, uh, scheduling there. And uh, again, the complexities you're doing optimization of energy and cellular services and, and, and uh, virtual uh, bids. And also in the case of Aircard, actually, which is using our system also, the congestion revenue rights which is uh, the only place uh, that uh, has that sort of uh, complexity. Now, so as you increase the number of intervals, as you, you uh, uh, make the horizon longer, then the problem becomes bigger and more complex to solve. So that's, that's where we need to, 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 to be careful. In terms of flexibility, uh, I, I said the various resources, uh, uh, whether it's generation, uh, reserve, or, or transmission. Uh, on the generation side, we, we have a wide range of complexities to, to have uh, to deal with. For instance, uh, combined cycle plants. Uh, in the case of ERCOT, uh, they have uh, complex uh, combinations and configurations that could be up to, I would say, somewhere around 17 or 20 different configurations at just one plant. And uh, as part of the overall solution, we have to optimize that. That's a complexity, even though it, it in some ways is a flexibility in the system, but we have to do that. And then at the same time, we have uh, sort of uh, fast start units, seemingly very simple, but no, because they, they have to consider now their, their startup cost, uh, the minimum uh, generation cost, uh, all of that into, into the optimization that, uh, that makes it more, more complex. Reserves uh, uh, could be very complex, uh, Nagawa dependent reserve capabilities and as was discussed earlier as uh, we have these DERs and other uh, intermittencies and, uh, and transmission congestion within the, the, the grid. Uh, so local uh, reliability requirements are becoming prevalent and, and, and they could be also uh, uh, complex. I mentioned the case of New York uh, a little bit later. Ramping as part of flexibility, obviously, but again, ramping models could be quite, uh, quite complex, megawatt dependent, non-convex, uh, uh, for region regions and so on and so forth. Actually, these are all uh, used uh, the, again in the Ireland system that was mentioned earlier, also uh, to, to some degree in New York and air systems. And transmission, of course, uh, 
you talked about, I it was mentioned, Jeff mentioned about dynamic rating and so on. Those are uh, input to the system, but, uh, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, our, our tools have to be able to really optimally use the transmission system. And uh, there are ways of doing that, post-contingency correctives as part of the optimization, uh, phase angle uh, regulations, remedial actions, all of these are part of uh, trying to utilize the transmission uh, to the best of its capabilities. So that said, uh, energy storage is, is a very fundamental part of his uh, uh, dealing with the uh, renewables and, and intermittent, their in intermittency. Well, there are different kinds, uh, uh, short term, very short term, I would call it uh, like flywheels, they're mostly used for regulations or ESRs, energy storage resources like batteries. These are, you can call it short term storages and of course, Palm Hato storage. And we have actually worked uh, with our uh, uh, customers across the world to model all of these. In Ireland, uh, again, as was mentioned, uh, we use uh, pump hydro uh, systems, uh, national grid, pump hydro again. In New York, flywheels, uh, they have pump hydro as well, and also uh, storage. And we worked uh, with New York uh, to actually, uh, as part of the Collaborative R&D first, then we did actual implementation for them to, to meet uh, Fair Code 841 compliance uh, 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 requirements uh, fully. And uh, actually the, we, we, we tried to, because the complexity there is yes, one is the modeling to, to make sure uh, you meet the requirements of the order and also meet the, uh, your operational requirements as well as uh, as you, the number of resources, ESR resources increases, uh, you meet the performance uh, issues, performance requirements uh, in terms of computational uh, performance. Yeah. So uh, next, uh, uh, this was sort of uh, uh, what we have been doing uh, overall, but uh, uh, give you some recent examples of what we have been doing uh, with New York ISO working together collaboratively for the last uh, two, three years. Uh, two, I, I, I divide them into two groups, these activities. One is development, uh, uh, what uh, we actually develop and deliver, and uh, they go online, these sort of features. And one is what we're doing together uh, as part of a, a collaborative uh, uh, sort of research and development. Development uh, areas, uh, examples, uh, larger scale solar and dispatch, uh, uh, hybrid resources, fast started pricing, reserve uh, for resource flexibility, ancillary service shortage pricing, and also DER integration. I mentioned, uh, uh, I will uh, briefly mention uh, each one of them uh, later. Uh, in terms of investigation, uh, uh, <clears throat> to do, uh, mention dynamic reserves. Yes, that's one area. The other one is dark burner modeling. I will briefly uh, describe those. Large scale solar on dispatch, <clears throat> basically uh, uh, the, now that the, this sort of resources, solar resources are being treated just like wind resources, they can actually participate in the real time market and respond to uh, uh, economic dispatch. There's many advantages, obviously, uh, avoiding out of market curtailment. Uh, basically, they are able to set uh, market prices. Uh, uh, that way you avoid the negative pricing and also uh, it, it provides additional flexibility uh, uh, to the grid. That, that's what we're looking for. A more uh, uh, sort of, I would say, uh, uh, a major feature is, is, is the, we have already done ESR, these are the energy storage resources modeling, optimally uh, uh, schedule them uh, 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 to other markets, uh, market uh, sequences. Uh, also now we are working with them to implement what is called uh, hybrid, uh, uh, co-located and hybrid resources. Uh, the, the difference between co-located and, and hybrid is that the co-located you have uh, sort of uh, energy storage and uh, intermittent resources behind uh, a point of injection, but uh, there are two different resources. They can independently participate in the market. In the case of hybrid actually, they are joint. They're, you have these sort of resources behind the, the uh, one point of injection, but at the same time, uh, they, they basically participate in the wholesale market as a single source rather than and, and, and two different types. Gosro, if you could try to wrap up, uh, we are over time. Sure, just getting there. 
And then, uh, so we have uh, other activities, as I mentioned, uh, that are also contributing to more flexibility and higher efficiency in terms of ancillary service shortage pricing, reserve for uh, resource flexibility, and also enhanced fast start pricing. Uh, I will, in the interest of time, I, I go faster. Then this uh, DR integration, obviously, uh, a FERC order number 2222 requires ISO to permit uh, a DR uh, participation in, in the market. So a generic model is what we have. The, any number of DRs, depending on their size, could directly participate in the market, go to an aggregator or go to the system, uh, uh, distribution system operator. And uh, now we are implementing this for New York. And of course, there are size, uh, what, what size uh, limits uh, they can participate and so on. But that's a very generic model that actually will comply with fair order and also at the same time, it will uh, bring more efficiency into their market and systems. Dynamic reserve, the, the, the crux of this, this, this uh, investigation, this is one of those R&Ds that we, we are doing together jointly, is that basically existing reserve requirements uh, are essentially static, that's what they are. And that's not really uh, efficient and that's uh, uh, also, uh, uh, it doesn't provide the flexibility that you, that you need. In order to achieve efficiency, what you wanna do is that you, you want to make sure uh, in the way you dynamically determine the minimum uh, local operating requirements that you re require. And that's, that's uh, much different from the static that we were doing. And for that, you, you wanna rely on uh, basically not just the local, local to the, to the zone or area that you're uh, defining the rely, uh, uh, reserve requirement for. Uh, you not only you depend on the local reserve, uh, the reserve resources, you also uh, account for how much reserve you can bring in from the neighboring zones or areas uh, through the available transmission. And that has to be all dynamically done within the optimization. So it's a quite a complex problem. And uh, Tulu also mentioned some, 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 some related uh, application of it for the, for the offshore wind and so on. But this is applies to actually any part of the New York system where, where you have, as, as you can see, uh, uh, many different uh, sort of nested uh, uh, zones and, and areas where, where uh, uh, local uh, uh, reserve requirements are defined for. It's, it's quite an interesting and complex problem, but it's gonna be uh, contributing to uh, improving efficiency uh, and availability of the market. The last item uh, I'll, I'll try to say is this uh, uh, improved dark uh, uh, firing cycle model. Uh, basically, reserves and regulation resources are required to achieve their emergency, uh, at, at, uh, basically at the emergency rate, response rate. And uh, most units cannot do that. It's not quite uh, realistic, especially uh, New York uh, has uh, many combined cycle plants where if uh, you turn on their dark firing, uh, their dark firing a cycle, then they can contribute uh, uh, additional uh, capacity, but they are slower and, 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 and usually they don't participate because they can't respond to, to the uh, uh, emergency rate. So what we are doing, we are, we are trying to model, uh, the, 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 uh, enable the system to model uh, uh, ramping rates very accurately. They are some of them very complex. Uh, we, we have to deal with both modeling and also deal with the uh, uh, computational complexities that it, it presents. And we are doing that together with New York right now. So these were examples. So to summarize uh, uh, out of time, uh, basically, yes, we, we are uh, working with our uh, uh, customers, our uh, ISOs that we work with uh, to advance modeling and analytical capabilities to address integration of intermittent resources and load stochasticity. Uh, the more realistic model, yes, uh, you, 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 it, it contributes to the more efficiency and higher reliability, but the challenge is, is really with, with the higher performance uh, uh, scheduling and market uh, clearing uh, solutions that we need. For that, uh, of course, there are ways of doing it, uh, more efficient models and problem formulations, um, mix uh, integer programming uh, engine tunings, but also we are looking at new algorithms algorithms that have not been uh, tested before. We are seeing actually working in algorithms that actually work much, much better when the problem is more complex. They're much more valuable when the problems are more complex. So we are looking at it from all angles. So improving the, the models, uh, 
contributing to efficiency, dealing with the uh, intermittency at the same time, uh, trying to solve the uh, computational complexities that we, we, we encounter. Yeah, thank you. Again, thank you very much, Kosrow.